two, three, four. Sometimes we need to slow it down. Take a look around. These times go by so very fast Moments never last Just breathe Breathe in, breathe out Be quiet, be still, don't shout Love is what it's all about Just breathe Sometimes Enough. Living is just too tough Just breathe Cause you'll regret When these days are past Your friend has seen you last Just breathe Breathe in, breathe out Quiet, be still, don't shout Good evening and welcome to another exciting episode of the Just Love Show in here in beautiful Northern California, <clears throat> where I'm sure, um, with the exception of in December where we did get the little rain, um, everyone's probably getting a little tired of me telling you how beautiful it is here today. But it is absolutely stunningly gorgeous. And like we do before every show, we're going to take a deep, sit back, take a deep breath, Think about all the things we have to be grateful for, all the abundance in our lives, all the love in our lives, and really focus on that because that's the energy I want everyone to have as they listen to the show, and I want it to hopefully carry over into the next day. Um, as I've been doing, uh, before I get to my guest tonight, read a little something that um, I think is appropriate uh, uh, that goes along with the show, and this just sort of felt to me as I was going through I wanted to read something that really em- felt like it captured the spirit of creativity, which my guest tonight, um, truly, uh, when it comes to music and other art forms, is, is somebody who I, I think will appreciate this. Um, this body, this life, this love, I am not, nor will I ever be. For this or any body, this or any life, this or any love, this or any me, we is innately God infinity, the divine rainbow prism, the holy trinity of infinite information, the raw formless data of which all creation takes shape. Infinite energy, the supreme creative consciousness that shapes the formless data into creation. Infinite force, the binding, attracting, undeniable intention of love to manifest creation so that God infinity may experience itself. God infinity, infinitely dreaming, dreamt the infinite abstract that was into the infinite creation that is. All stories, all lies, all truths, all illusions of the sublime divine mind's brilliantly beautiful designs. To love myself, ourselves, is to love God infinity, for God infinity is all that is. And I, we, are but blessed figments of her imagination, given free will to forget and pretend, to play in her sandbox of infinite space-time that me, we, are other, that me, we, this body, this time, this love, are for moments real. This is no, this is no me, we, this, there is no me, we, there is only God, infinity, experiencing herself, disguised as mother, giving birth to an uh, unending, unimaginably fantastical opus that is infinite creation. And then I want to follow up with the quotes uh, from Alan Watts. And, and when, when I wrote that, I didn't think about uh, tying it to music specifically, but Alan Watts really believed that um, music was an entirely, uh, it was a universal language, that it was actually the source of all language. And you'll understand why I'm hitting on the music theme tonight in just a bit. 
when I introduce my guest. Uh, quote from Alan Watts, the religious idea of God cannot do full duty to the metaphysical infinity. Um, before I get to my guest, who I, I know everyone's going to be thrilled to hear his, uh, the story of his life and all the things that he's done in the music industry, um, I had thought I had done a little bit in the music business. I loaded 65,000 pounds of frozen strawberries on a semi-truck uh, to get into San Francisco with 25 cents in my pocket, mistakenly looking for the 60s 20 years too late, only to find little L.A. and its hair band scene here. I played in bands. I wrote for Bam Magazine. I had the good fortune of uh, being able to interview uh, who are some of the most well-known artists of our times, from Gwen Stefani and No Doubt to Joan Jett to uh, Green Day. I got to work with uh, Linda Perry for a bit from the Four Non Blondes, who now is songwriter supreme, and got to work with Alex Skolnick, uh, the lead guitar player in Testament. But none of this, none of anything that I've done, comes even close to the guest I have tonight, who, amongst other things, is the new CEO of WLOR.net. And how fortunate are we to have him on board? Before I tell you his name, I'm going to read to you who he's worked with. Led Zeppelin, ACDC, Phil Collins, Frank Zappa, Paul Anka, Charlie Daniels, Aerosmith, Kiss, Mariah Carey, The Jacksons, Journey, El Chicano, Phil Collins, Pete Brown, songwriter for Cream, Steve Wonder, <coughs> Chicago, The Who, John Antwistle in regards to the soundtrack of the movie Jerry Maguire, Kim Wilde, Kate Bush, ABBA, Wet, 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 Simply Red, Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me, Anne Murray, Steve Miller, Dave Matthews, Elton John, ELO, Roxanne, um, David uh, Nazareth, Booker T and the MG, Santana, Vicky Carr, Jesse J, Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones, Friends of Distinction, and if you can believe this, many, many more. And maybe we'll find out from Jerry to, oh, I let his name slip. Well, my guest tonight <clears throat> is Jerry Gallagher. Uh, he's a legend in the music business, uh, producer, uh, marketing, distribution. When I say he worked with these people, he worked uh, intimately with these people. And maybe we'll get him to share with us who the craziest uh, partiers were that he worked with. Um, but without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Jerry Gallagher to the Just Love Show. Jerry, welcome. Thank you, Kip. Thank you. That was a very, very kind uh, uh, introduction there. I really do appreciate that. But uh, yeah, it just it just proves I've been around for a long time. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 do we do amass our uh, experiences as we go along. Um, but let's start from the beginning. How did you go from Glasgow, Scotland, to Calabasas, California? And please don't short us on the details. Wow, it's a long journey. Six sixty some odd years. Uh, well, fifty some odd years. <laughs> um, yeah, I came over here with my parents in uh, 1963, and uh, we uh, emigrated from Scotland uh, to uh, to California in 1963, and um, uh, we went to a place called Echo Park in Los Angeles area, the, the little community of Echo Park in Los Angeles, and I love that place to, to this day because I learned so much there, and I grew up around so much, so many. Uh, fine artists and musicians that, that were all making Echo Park and Silver Lake their home at the time, and still do to this day, but uh, uh, they were making Echo Park their home, and um, that was their transition from where they were uh, coming into Los Angeles and where they were going, which, you know, uh, was the upper echelon of the music industry, but, you know, I, I hang out with guys like uh, like uh, you know, Linda Ronset, well, guys or girls like Linda Ronset, Woody Guthrie, and and uh, Ryan Ross and uh, Jackson Brown and Glenn Fry and Frank Zappa and J.D. Souther, um, you know, Tom Waits. They all lived in the, the same community I did, um, same area of Los Angeles that I did. And we grew up together. Um, you know, I knew the Eagles before they were the Eagles. They were, they were the backup band for Linda Ronstadt, the uh, Stone Ponies at the time. And we used to hang out in the, uh, in the, uh, the areas of uh, back of park together. So, you know, it's been a journey from, from Scotland to Los Angeles, and then through the years, uh, getting, getting associated with, with, uh, the music industry through amateur again. And then, you know, I live today in Calabasas, which again is, a, is, is a, a ironic because some of the guys I grew up in Echo Park, uh, back in the day are now uh, neighbors up here in Calabasas, which is, you know, the, the new Mecca for the, uh, 
for the, the music industry out here in California. So it's been a, a 360 degree journey that uh, has brought me back to the same neighbors I had in, in Echo Park. But uh, loving it, I love music. Uh, that's why I'm on the show because it's all about love, and I, I contend that music is the greatest love you have. A- a- absolutely. Um, to back up, well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say you know uh, little prayers and best wishes. However, you send good energy to somebody, I'd like to send a, a, some of that energy and love out to Linda Ronstadt right now. Uh, she oh, could yeah. definitely yeah. Y- use our prayers and and uh, you know really hope that uh, we someday get to hear her amazing voice again. Exactly. And, exactly. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now you you moved over here from um, Glasgow to uh, L.A. Um, when at what point in your life did you know you wanted to be involved with music? Were you a musician yourself? Um, when did that uh, desire? When did you know that's what you wanted to be in your life? Um, I I knew music was going to be part of my life from from a you know a young age. I was always I was always intrigued with music and loved music. And uh, be- before I get into that, let me just also put out some some positive energy to to a good friend who's in hospital right now, Joni Mitchell. Uh, Joni oh yes, absolutely. Yesterday, and I uh, love that woman, and she's what an inspiration she had on a lot of people. And um, you know, uh, Laurel Canyon days, I hung out with Joni and all that group up in Laurel Canyon, and. No, my best wishes go out to her and uh, and Linda, of course. But uh, you know, two great women mm-hmm. and that I are good friends of mine, and I, you know, want to wish them all the best. But yeah, Maybe, I mean, um, go yeah, ahead. I, I'm I'm a huge uh, Joni Mitchell fan. I, I'm so happy you brought that up. Uh, quick little side note on uh, Joni. I I've never known her personally, um, but I used to. Um, n- well, I still know him. I n- knew a guitar player, and I like to think of him as sort of the Z leg of uh, the music industry. A guy named Wayne the Train Perkins. He was a um, session player in um, down in Muscle Shoals, and uh, he actually lived with Joni for a while. And he had such wonderful things to say about her. Yeah, she's a, a wonderful person, and uh, you know, she's she, last I heard today, she's she's recuperating. Okay, she's she's up and talking, so. You know, my love goes out to her. I, I posted on Facebook, on my page on Facebook earlier, uh, well, yesterday when I heard the news and, you know, I've been monitoring it. So good luck to her. I, I wish her all the best. And, uh, you know, she's still got a lot to give to the music industry and, uh, and, uh, we, we love her. But, uh, in regards to your question, how I got involved in music and where, you know, at what, what time in my life I was involved in music. Uh, growing up, I was always around music. I had music, you know, playing all the time. Anytime I was studying, anytime I was, you know, I was watch, I was listening to music instead of watching TV. That was the kind of guy I was, and and um, I played bass. I I, I learned um, early on how to play the bass because I couldn't play the, the guitar better than the guys around me. So I decided that um, a frustrated guitar player becomes a bass player. So that's what happened. Uh, I became a bass player, and then I found out that uh, that there was better bass players in the world. And I thought, well, uh, I'll go into soccer, believe it or not. And I became a, a professional soccer player. I played soccer for several years, and uh, it was actually through soccer that I, I met the the guy that got me intricately involved in music, and that was M. Erdogan. Uh, I was playing professional soccer, and M. owned a professional soccer team at the time. Uh, he owned the New York Cosmos, and I was playing out here with San Jose Earthquakes wow. and the um, and the LA Aztecs. And uh, Amit was always trying to get me to come back to um, to uh, New York to play. And uh, I kept telling him, you know, hey, man, I'm 17, 18 years old. I'm out here in California. It's 80 degrees. There's sun. There's sand. You know, there's beaches. There's girls running around in bikinis. I said, if you get that out in New York, I'll be out there in a heartbeat. And needless to say, that never happened. So I stayed here and enjoyed the, the sunshine. But I, I uh, Amit was a, uh, he was a very good friend, and he got me into music uh, at the upper echelon. So music's always been in my blood, and... Um, I'm so glad that, you know, I, I got the chance to meet up with Amit and he turned the the world of music over to me and open to me and uh, I uh, I've loved it ever since. I've just been you know, I have two loves in my life, my family and, and music and uh they they're pretty close to each other. Yeah, I I'm I'm gonna have you um uh, go into a little bit about who Amit was because what I found especially with um a lot of the uh, younger generations is there's not this connection to the source of a lot of music and I think it's I, I try to do my best to always educate uh, give you an example I was at a 
a social media event a couple years ago and I was talking to um, a young lady there about Pink and just saying, you know, that I think she's one of the uh, best female vocalists out there right now. And I said, you know, you should hear her do Janice sometime. And this woman looked at me like I was from another planet, had no idea who Janice Joplin was. And I went, wow. okay, I'm going to have to not just take for granted that people know these things, although I, it sort of dumbfounds me a little bit because growing up, I wasn't around when Cap Calloway was around. I, I wasn't around when Beethoven was around. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> even less known people than that, you know, I, I knew who my grandparents loved. I knew who my great-grandparents loved. And I listened to that music. And I find it a little bit disturbing sometimes that people don't make that connection. But I'd love for you to share who Amit was and just how he shaped the face of music um, in large part, not to really what it is today, but he definitely uh, was the driving force behind a, a lot of uh, the music that we all grew up with. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Alan Erdogan, Erdogan is, is the pivotal point in my life, uh, changed my life and sent me in the direction of my life that, um, that I'm still enjoying to this very day. So uh, I have Anytime I can talk about Anna Erdogan, I'm talking about him and I'm giving him all the praise in the world. He is, you know, my mentor, and um, I was glad to be able to call him not just a, a colleague but a friend as well. Uh, Amit Erdogan was the founder of Atlantic Records, and Atlantic Records was um, a crossover um, label uh, when most people weren't crossing over. I mean, it started off really as a jazz label that, that turned into rhythm and blues and and then uh, rock and roll. And Am Amit Erdogan was the spearhead of that. He also ended up um, being bought out by Warner Brothers and became the CEO of Warner Brothers and Atlantic Records. So he was an amazing individual who had uh, foresight way beyond uh, anybody's dreams. I mean, he, he was thinking of bringing the, um, the British uh, invasion over here long before anybody else did. And he brought over the likes of Led Zeppelin. He brought over the likes of the Rolling Stones. He brought over... You know, famous, famous names now that in the past were you know, were just up and coming bands out of out of the UK, and uh, he also had a crossover with with the rhythm and blues and, and and bringing black music into the white society that that was dominant back in the in the late 50s and into the 60s. So he was one of those crossover guys that that saw music for what it was. It didn't have a race. It didn't have a creed. It didn't have a color. It was music. It was genuine music and he wanted to bring that together and he brought in you know Bruno Mars and, and, and Ryan Starr and Coldplay and, and, and Cher and, and uh, you know Rolling Stones and people you know across the board that were that were amazing people that um, that made their, their name in, in music with the help of Emma Erdogan and you know you, you go back to the likes of Aretha Franklin he, he made Aretha Aretha was a dying uh, dying talent when she was with the, at Columbia, I mean, and he brought him, brought her over to to uh, Atlantic and made her a superstar. And, and Ray Charles and Wilson Pickett and stuff like that. Otis Redding was another great Atlantic uh, record um, uh, aficionado there. So um, yeah, Emmett was special. He was a really special individual who um, you know started the company back in Atlantic back in 1947, I think it was, and it grew and grew and grew and grew and. Grew and when I got involved with Amit, it was it was one of the top labels in the, in the world, for that matter, and it was a huge, huge uh, 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 pleasure to be in his company. He was musically inclined. He, his father was a Turkish diplomat, believe it or not, and Amit used to go down to Harlem in the middle of the night to go to Harlem in the middle of the night in New York and, and go down and listen to jazz in, in Harlem and um, invite the jazz players up to the uh, Turkish embassy to play in the foyer because you can get a great um, sound out of the foyer at, at, the, at that uh, particular building there. And that was the kind of guy he was. He was uh, around music. And you, you, if, you have it, if you have any interest in the history of music, look up Am Erdogan. Amit was what they called the sultan of music. He was the sultan of music. And I, you know, that man to this day is on my shoulder. When I have a question that I need to, to figure out in music or if I'm doing something in the way of, of you know, uh, in music where I need to make a decision, it's, it's a hard decision, I always think of what Amit would do. And that was exactly what, you know, what, what I, how I, I, I form my opinions and things because Amit had, he had this special way of looking forward and, and making things happen and, and developing talent that other people didn't see and, um, and foresight. That was 
you know, it's amazing foresight. So Ahmed had already heard it in to me and another gentleman by the name of Tom Dowd. If you want to learn about engineering, Tom Dowd is the guy you want to you know, look up and, and talk about because he invented all the things that are taken for granted today. He invented all the sliders on, on, on music boards. That was, that, that was Tom Dowd that invented that. Um, again, part of the, uh, the Atlantic uh, group and the, the Amit family. So Tom Dowd and Amit, a uh, lot of credit to. They are, you know, pivotal in my life and, you know, really put together in me something that I never saw and made me uh, look at music as my career and my life and my ambition. And, you know, 40 years later, I'm still doing what I love. So, you know, yeah, look up those guys and re- review them. It, the, the industry today, you have to respect what went before because what, what people are enjoying now was built on the foundation so that Dan and Tom and other people built for them. And don't lose sight of that. You know, there, there's, there's amazing people out there that were doing things when they weren't, when nobody else was doing them, building things when people weren't even thinking about it. And Amit Erdogan and Tom Dowd are two people that, that I uh, experienced in my life that, uh, you know, I have high, high praise for. And I love both of them. I love them like, you know, like my own family, and I thank them immensely. So, yeah, Amit Erdogan, Tom Dowd, check it out. Do a Google on them. You'll see, you'll see how influential these guys were to music and are still. Some of the things that they did in the 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s, and, and God love them, when, when Tom died in the 80s, um, that was it. Well, now, Amit died uh, the way he would have wanted to die. Uh, he passed on several years ago, but Amit died at a Rolling Stone concert. Well, he <laughs> fell and hit his head at a Rolling Stone, Stones concert and died a few years, a few uh, uh, days later. But um, that was, that was, that would if he had a uh, chance to script his own death, that would have been the way he would have scripted it. But he, he died at a Rolling Stones concert. So, yeah, he went out in style. Um, and I love him. Yeah, I love both those guys. And, you know, the, the, uh, they, they gave me what I have today. And I thank, thank them for that. There are certainly, I, 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 you know, think you're probably right. What a, what a, you know, obviously not falling in, hitting your head, but dying, you know, where you love, uh, in the company of all of the beans you love that I, I can think of no better way to leave this, uh, physical plane behind. Well, definitely. And, um, and like I said, if I could have scripted it, that he certainly would have done that. Go out at a Rolling Stone concert. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you were playing soccer. Um, Amit was trying to coerce you to go to New York to play soccer. What was that transition? And and did you know? Um, you know, like for me, I look back in in hindsight. I'm like, oh my god. Uh, in fact, I, I had uh, one of those oh my god moments last week where um, Yogesh Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's great nephew, is a good friend of mine, and. I met him through very normal circumstances. I put together a public market in Vallejo, and he was one of my vendors. Uh, he was doing vegan Indian food. Even though he's a doctor, as a business, he'd helped start for his son. And uh, we became friends through that market. And, and it really didn't sink in fully to me that, I, even though Gandhi's been a huge influence in my life, along with Martin Luther King and Buddha and Jesus and all these other tremendous love, empathy seekers, um, but it wasn't until last Thursday that it really sunk in who my friend was. And it was as I was holding handwritten notes from Mahatma to his wife. And as I was driving home, I went, oh, my God, my life is so miraculous that I'm in the company of people like Yogi and so many other people have crossed my path. Did you know who Amit was at that time or was it in retrospect as you got to know him and especially now that he's gone that it really sunk in who he was to you and how did you make that transition from uh, soccer player to music industry executive and what were some of the first things you did in the music business? Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, when I look back now, I mean, I I think you you put your life in retrospect um, you know, and look back, and uh, it, it amazes you. You know, and, and in my case, it really amazes me when I look back because I never planned any of this. I never thought that I would be like this. I, I you know, when I get to, I got together with some some friends from from grammar school a few years ago, and they were like, "Oh my God, you both played with this guy. You did this, you did that." And, and I took that all for granted. I really did. I took it all for granted 
and it was just part of what my life was, and I was going through it. I mean, I I, went, I, I met the the guys from the Eagles before they were the Eagles, and then I watched them become superstars. And but they were my friends, and and I was you know good friends with Kate Brown, who wrote all the Cream songs. And you know when you're doing that, and when you're going through that time, and when you're seeing this happen, um, they're 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 not they're not history yet, but. In retrospect, when you look back, they were a part of history. And the same with Amit. When I, you know, when I talk to people in, in the new Amit or, or you know, talk to people at New Atlantic Records, I'll like, oh my God, you knew Amit early then. Yes, I did. And I, and, and I, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but I took it for granted for a long uh, period of time what, who Amit was and what significance he was. And, you know, the same way as when I worked with, with Frank Sinatra in 1991, I took it for granted. And years later, you, you, you talk to people and they're telling you what their perspective of, of you know, Ahmed Erdogan or Frank Sinatra or, or the likes of Frank, uh, Frank Zappa and, and Paul Anka and people like that. And it's like, do you work with these guys? And I thought, you know, in retrospect, when you look back and go, oh my God, yeah, I did. And I, I remember reading an article that was, was done about me about four, or five, six years ago. And um, I read the article and I usually don't read the press. I just don't. I don't read it. But this article just, I just sat down one day and I picked it up and I was reading it. And all of a sudden I became a third party, a third member of my own life. I started to look at it going, oh my God, you know, look at these names. You were part of this. And, and then when you think about it, you, 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 when you were coming through it, you were not thinking about what you were doing. You were not thinking about making history. You were not thinking about this as a significant milestone in music. Um, those came later because they, then when they look back, they were significant. And when they look back, they changed the, the, the course of music. And, you know, when I was with, with Alexis Zeppelin on the road with Zeppelin and, and Peter Grant and stuff like that, well, now you look back and what Peter Grant did with, with Led Zeppelin and, and venues and, and uh, changing that whole atmosphere, that was historic. That was immense. And when you were doing it, when we were going through it, it was just a hard chore that we were working on at that time to get things done and, and move on and get on the next plane to the next venue and, and, and do the, you know do what we had to do. It's the same as with Emmett. When I used to go into to New York and go, Emmett would call me and say, hey, pick me up. We're going to go to dinner. And we'd go to dinner and we'd go from nightclub to nightclub to nightclub, to, you know, Studio 54 and all that stuff and meet the upper echelon of, of the world now. Um, but at that time, they were up and coming guys. They were just people that, that were part of our life. And, you know, and then 20 years later, you know, Phil Collins is a huge superstar, and and you know, you know Mick Hucknell is a huge, huge superstar, and you know, Stevie Wonder is not little Stevie Wonder anymore. He's a huge superstar. Um, those were those were the points that when you look back, and your question is a great question because when you look back in retrospect, you have to look back as a third party and say, wow, you know, and you know, I think you you mentioned that yourself. You started to appreciate who your friends were. You, had to, you started to appreciate who your colleagues are. I started to appreciate who I'd worked with and said, oh my, you know, what an amazing uh, array of people. And, and I don't say that because I want to be included in that. I say that from the standpoint of humility saying, wow, I am so lucky. I am so honored. I'm so blessed to be have been put in that position to be part of that. Right place, right time. The industry was right for it. It was a burgeoning industry, just ready to blow up in a big, big way. And all these guys were coming through and, you know, you mentioned all those, you know, the, the people I work with, ACDC, Phil Collins, Charlie Daniels, you know, Stevie Wonder, Kate Bush, yeah, what, what, what. Um, all these guys were, were, they had to start somewhere. And that's where I was around when they were starting and coming up in, in their early ages of, of their development and was able to be part of that. And now when you look back, that's Zeppelin's, a, you know, one of the biggest bands that's ever, ever been. Well, Back when I was with them, they were they were a big band and they were well known, but they were they were in competition with a hundred other bands that were out there. And um, you know, history dictates what what history is, and um, you know, it's looking back. And so I can only say that I'm humbled. I'm I'm, I, I'm so so grateful to be able to say that I did uh, have association with all these different people. And uh, I say that with the humblest in the humblest way possible because. You know, I never, I never dreamed this. I never dreamed that I would have. I'd be sitting 40 years later talking about, you know, being friends with these people and, and associate with these people and producing these people and, and working on distribution and marketing and promotion and all that with all these uh, different bands and what have you. I, I, you know, I'm the most staggered guy in the world when I look back at my life and say, wow, it came out pretty good. 
and I had no plans for it. It was just, you know, it just developed. So, um, and the other part of your question, how do I got, how I got involved with Amit? Um, yeah, Amit brought me under his wing and we started to do things and Amit had a, a philosophy of hands on philosophy. So he gave me some projects to do and they, they worked out and he was in, he liked what I was doing. And then he just decided to put me on the road with, with, with the bands he was investing a lot of money in and being the eyes and ears on the ground for him. And that's how I got involved with Led Zeppelin, on ACDC, ABBA and the likes and um, you know, I was I was eyes and ears on the ground for, for Amit and traveled the world and went to four corners of the world and saw some amazing things and um, you know, a lot of people tell me I should write a book, but a lot of people have to die before I can do that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the reality of it is that I'm the most blessed and, and staggered guy in the world when I look back at my life and, and how I fit into that little bit of uh, history called uh, called music. And and how what was that transition from soccer to uh, the music business? When did that take place, and how exactly did um, you? How did Amit know that that was something you wanted to do, as opposed to when he couldn't get you to come play soccer in New York? How did that happen? Well, it, it, it's funny because I, I later got injured and I, I couldn't play anymore, and I started up a courier company. And at that time, DHL and PNT and and FedEx were all you know new and upcoming courier companies. So I started a, uh, a courier company and I was shipping for the, the movie industry and some of the, the, the music industry and that Atlantic Records was on, and Warner Bros. was one of my clients. So I was shipping their stuff around the world and this was way before internet where you had downloads. This is where if, if a disc jockey wanted to, if you wanted a disc jockey to play your, your music on the radio, you had to physically get them a, a, an album or a 45 or later on a cassette tape or even later on to that, you know, some discs, but um, it was all physical, and so was the computer industry. And I had the computer industry, I had the movie industry, and I had the music industry as, as clients because of the connections I had there. And um, because of that, I, you know, I was moving all around the world, I was constantly on the go. And, and I would always go into New York, and I'd make a point to go up to Hammett and sit down with him, and you know, have lunch with him, and just, just, you know, I just loved being in his presence. So, um, you know, I would go up there and. And how I got into the music industry instead of being in the courier industry was that I was sitting in his office one day and he said to me, he had some reports that had just come across the desk and he was looking at them and he was saying, yeah, yeah. I had a gruff voice, hey, I can't believe this. And I said, uh, what's wrong? He goes, oh, look at this. This is, this is my distribution figures for South America. And I said, okay. He goes, I'm getting 2% and 3% of my product through. I go, are you kidding me? And he says, no, no, you, you're in the career business. What what can you do to figure this out? I go, I don't know anything about the music business. I don't know anything about music distribution. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, can you do better than 2%? I said, well, I think and I think a monkey could do better than 2%. If you're sending out 100% and you're only getting 2%, and Emmett said to me, son, you're now my monkey. <laughs> and he threw the, the papers over at me, and he said, look into it, figure it out, and let's figure out what's going on here. Uh, I trust you. So I started to look into why his music distribution, physical music distribution in South America, was not working out. And what it was was customs. He, he, the, the stuff would be sent down there. There was customs guys that were taking the stuff and putting it on the black market. So, um, and that happened with a lot of the, uh, lot of the labels. So a lot of what was destined for, for the stores in, in South America were not getting through. So I, I started to look into it, and then I, through my career company, we did all the distribution. We started putting it into our own warehouses. We had customs in in our warehouse instead of outside, you know, where they could be pilfered. And all of a sudden, the numbers just changed drastically. And at that point, you know, that's where I said, oh, my God, you know, I can't believe what you did here. Well, I just, it was basic common sense. We had just figured out what the problem was and, and, and sorted it out. But... At that point, then he said, you know, I was like special, special projects for him. Go do this, go do that, go do this, go do that. Go over and see this band. I'm putting a lot of money into it. And I ended up going over there and meeting Jimmy Page and John Bonham and yeah, the rest of history. So, um, you know, that was, that was basically it. I, you know, the, the industry was, was a fledgling industry at that point. I mean, we were reaching around the world and really didn't know what they were doing. And a lot of this was going on. I mean, there was a lot of black market going on. And, and um, you know, once, once you sorted it out, you sorted it out. And, and you moved on. And, uh, again, I didn't do anything special. I just figured out what the problem was, sorted it around, 
and turn the figures upside down so that they were realistic again. Instead of 2% getting through, we're back at 90% getting through. So it was, um, it was a, you know, and, and then at that point, then uh, Capital, EMI, Columbia, they all got in touch with me and, and, and things started to develop music wise for me. And then Amit, you know, put me on the road with the Led Zeppelin from 1976 to 1980 when um, one of my best friends in the business, John Bonham, Bonzo died and, in 1980. And uh, so I was on the road with them from 76 to 80 and uh, then ACDC and the rest. But, uh, you know, it was it was just a transition time in my life. And I was, I was young, I was energetic, I was wanting to find out what I wanted to do with life. And I was given the opportunity to, to look into things that were intriguing to me and saying, well, how do I, how do I turn this around, man? And it was a lot of hard work and a lot of, you know, head banging to just to figure it all out. But once it was figured out, it was it was pretty pretty clear as what was going on and pretty clear what we had to do. And we did it. And again, you know, I had Amit behind me who was like, Yeah, kid, go do it. Go do it. Let's get it done. Let's let's show the world. And and uh, that's what sticks with me all the time. I'm so, I'm probably one of the most positive people in the world because I met Amit again and you know, he told me there's nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't do. You can always find a way to complain afterwards, and, and, and there's always a way that you, you can make it not work, but, you know, go out there and try at least, you know, give it, give it your all and, and make it happen, and, uh, you know, things will come out of that. So that was, to me, you know, that's how I got involved with Atlantic. That's how I got out, you know, out on the road, and um, I made some tremendous friends in my life. You, you never fail when you choose to experience, when you choose. That's one thing I can look back on my life and despite any mistakes, any uh, <clears throat> challenges, anything, there's nothing I would change because I can honestly look back and say, I walked through any door I wanted to walk through. Right or wrong, I walked through the door. And, exactly. and, that, exactly. and that is, uh, it, you know, just I, 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 it's so important for people to understand, you know, overcome that fear of the unknown. Walk through the door. You have nothing to lose. And at the worst case, you walk out with a new experience, a new um, amount of knowledge that you take forward in your life and that are, you're able to share with others. Exactly. That was a great words. And, you know, that door will always stay closed if you don't try to open it. And, you know, and what, what's the good of it then? You know, you're just looking at a, a, a closed door and you, ha- you, have to, you have to venture. You definitely have to venture in life. And, you know, if you're going to accomplish things that, that are important to you, you have to you have to put yourself in a position to, to, to meet that importance. And, you know, it doesn't come to you. You have to go find it. And, uh, you know, that, that's how I've, I've lived my whole life. I've, I've never been afraid to, to venture. I've never been afraid to explore. I've never been afraid to go out and say, okay, wow, that, they say that can't be done. Well, obviously, you know, it can. We just got to figure out a way of doing it. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's where it is. I mean, I, I, you know, music is that way. I mean, you know, People that come, you know, the hardest thing in the world is to, to, to write a song and develop a song and bring a song out and, you know, and believe in it for, for months or even years while you're developing it. And everybody's kind of, ah, you can't do a song, you can't do this, you can't do it. And then when you do, it's like, you know, it, it worked. I, I, I stuck in there. I made it happen. Well, that's because you, you loved what you're doing and you believed in yourself. And you can't believe in anything else if you don't believe in yourself. I mean, you have to be, you have to love yourself before you can love other people too. And that's, that's the most important thing. Be, be, be very confident in what you are and, 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 you know, work on that. And, and I work on that every day. I mean, I've, I learn something every single day because if you don't, you, you stop growing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you find that the more you love yourself, the more you love other people. And it's, it's, the more and that you have more the more you love yourself you have more love to give to other people and if you don't love yourself then you have no love to give to other people and you don't have a way to continue to make that love grow i i i think it was uh i think it's a buddha who said that love is never diminished it's like a candle you can just keep lighting it to paraphrase uh the quote you know, and the more the, the more you uh, are able to love yourself, the brighter your candle burns, and the more uh, others candles you're able to light. You you well, said I'm, you I'm, said I'm used, I'm used to have, used to have a, a saying that that success is a comfort zone you once left. You know, mm-hmm. you, have, you have to move out of your comfort zone and and, and move into other areas, and you know, you, you know, success is a comfort zone you, you we, once once left. So I was I was looking at that as a, you know moving forward, striving. 
We talk about comfort zones a lot here because it can be really dangerous because you can sit, you can be in the worst situation imaginable and that comfort zone will be better than that unknown you're afraid to step into. And uh, fear of the unknown stops so many people from achieving the goals in their life and also traps them in situations that they desperately need to leave. Very true, very true. I, I call it the, 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 the Kodak syndrome because uh, Kodak controlled the, the, uh, the, the film marketplace, one of the richest companies in the world, one of the most the biggest companies in the world. And became they they came, got into a comfort zone where they were very comfortable where they were and didn't realize it was a future, and that future was digital and digital destroyed Kodak and Kodak destroyed himself because they didn't keep up with what the future was going to hold and lived on their laurels up until there was none you know and and yeah. reality hit them and it's all over you know. Now, I, w I want to backtrack a little bit because you brought up something I was going to ask you a question about anyway as you know we're doing um. Uh, radio theater here. Uh, in fact, we, we had a meeting regarding an upcoming program we're, we're doing uh, in May, which is called The Road to Fenderville. It's all about a mythical town in Louisiana where all the supposedly uh, deceased rock stars and movie stars lived. And you mentioned um, John Bonham. He's actually one of the characters in, in the uh, show. Um, so many people, as I'm looking at the list of people you've worked with, so so many um, of these groups had members die. Some of these people are gone. Um, you kind of answer the question because John was close to you. But which which death um, shocked you the most? You know, you think about um, Bon Scott. You think about Keith Moon. Who there was some writing on the wall with that. But was every death a shock to you, or were were most of them you saw it coming? Um, you never see it coming. You you you. You envisage that they're doing the wrong thing and it's going to catch up with them, but you never see the death coming. 1980 was the changing year in my life. I realized in 1980 that rock and roll was not all fun and games. I realized that this whole, this whole surfboard of experience I was on going through life and catching every wave and it was a great wave, um, wasn't, wasn't reality. The, in 1980, you mentioned two names, Bon Scott and John Bonham. Those both were, were friends of mine. Those both were very close friends of mine. They both died in 1980. They both died within months months of each other. Reality hit me in the face with like like a, a, a baseball bat. I realized that, that this rock and roll game that we were on, this rock and roll beautiful music thing that we we, we all loved, it had a dark side. It had an ugly side. It had a, a, a mortal side, and it hit me so hard. A mortal I side. I love that. I love that. A yeah, mortal, mortal side. side. Yep. And, and I, it got so much that I almost gave it up. I just thought, this is too much to handle. And John Bonham was, was my friend, and he's gone. You know, and uh, Bon Scott was my friend, and they died the same way, and it was abuse of alcohol and taking it to the limits. And we all thought, hey, that's fun and games, you know, yeah, but you can control it. All right. but then you realize you, you couldn't control it. You couldn't. It, their lifestyle caught up with them. And I'm not going to question anybody's lifestyle. That's 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 their own thing, but it hurt. It really, really got to the core of my heart and my soul when, when these guys died. And it was a reality check. And they were young. They were in the prime of their life. They were, we were, we were with Zeppelin getting ready to do another United States tour. We were talking about it. We were at Jimmy Page's house and, and, and John, John was, he was having a bad day and he was drinking and, you know, I left him that day, and the last thing he said to me was, "Hey, man, look, look forward to the tour. I love you, man. See you later." And I walked wow. out, went to my hotel, and woke up the next wow. morning to to the news telling me John Bonham had died, and I could not believe it. I couldn't believe it for six months. I couldn't believe it for you know for a long period of time that that this was reality that just hit me in the face. And um, so it wasn't that any single death was more. It was that. A change in my life was brought on by guests and death of very close guys and and they were all part of the music scene and you know I can go back to you know, I was just reflecting with my wife just just yesterday that last year I lost 12 12 friends in music so but I can accept that now these were older guys that are coming to the end of their lives but it was very hard to accept that in 1980 um, John Bonham was gone you know, it was, it was very hard to understand that Bon Scott was gone. 
um, all right, there were crazy, happy-go-lucky guys that lived on the on the edge, but they were gone. They were now gone. It was all over. They were never coming back, and that was a reality check. So, um, yeah, it was tough. It was very, very, very tough. But it, in in hindsight, again, I look back now, thirty odd years later, and it was again a strengthening position in my life where I I now saw, okay, this is reality. You know, these things do happen. And you don't experience this and you don't understand they happen until they happen. And when they do happen, it's a magnitude. It, it's, 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 it's huge. It's huge. When, when a, a part of your life is now gone forever, it's, it's huge. You've got to fill that gap and it's almost impossible to do it. But it, it makes you a stronger person, makes you, you know, work, work harder to move on. And, um, you know, I, to this day, I mean, I, I, John Bonham's still in my heart, my soul, uh, you know, Bon Scott's still there. All these guys that, that were part of my life, and there's a, I, I go on and tell you 10 or 15 other guys, you know, that died at a young age, but those two really affected me, and 1980 was my turning point. Wow. Yeah, Bon, bon Scott hit me really hard just as... Uh, I mean, they all, all, all... Every musician's death hit me hard, but Bon... Um, Bon, I was just such a fan of ACDC's music and his style, and I, I did not, I wasn't even thinking about, I, well, I wouldn't think about anyone dying, but I don't know why just Bon Scott's death really sticks in my head. It just uh, was one of those things that, um, I think they were getting ready to come tour in Oregon, and I think I was getting ready to come uh, see them, and I was looking forward to it, and then it just didn't happen. And uh, yeah, you know, it, it never would. Tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, before Reality we move check. on, yeah. before we move on to talk about um, where the music industry has been, um, what, where it's gone, where you see it's going, and also what we, what your plans are with um, WL, WLOR.net in the future. I, I want to ask you one uh, question: um, of all the artists that you've worked with, who um, was who were some of the easiest artists to work with and who were more, to put it uh, diplomatically, who were the, some of the more exacting artists to work with? That's a good, well, good way of putting exacting. <laughs> exacting uh, the easier artists to work with were the ones that were the consummate professionals who came prepared, knew what they were going to do, and came in to do it. Um, I, I, I was told in the industry a couple of guys that I worked very closely with um, were almost impossible to work with, but I found them in to be the easiest, and that was Phil Collins and Frank Sinatra. Um, Phil Collins um, was very determined to do things the way he, he wanted to do them, and in retrospect and looking back, they were all the right ways. So the people that, that say it was hard to work for, they just didn't realize that he was a genius and he knew what to do. And uh, he, I found when, when, when you, somebody trusts you and you trust somebody back, then it's much easier to work with. So um, Phil Collins and Frank Zappa is another one. Really, really, you know, smart individuals, way ahead of their time. Um, and I found them really easy to work with. Some guys I find were just great guys was Nick Hucknell um, and Jim Kerr. I mean, they're great guys to work with. And uh, Ronnie Wood, I love Ronnie. He's just such a, such a great guy and fun to work with. I love Vicky Carr. Vicky was fantastic to work with. Um, you know, and again, they were all people that when they came to do their job, they were ready. They came to do the job. You didn't have to play games with them. And they were there to, to give you what they had, the talent that they had. And they respected that talent so much that they, they weren't going to play around with it. They were going to give you what you wanted and um, give you even more than what you wanted. So it, from my point of view, that was that was accomplishing my objectives so that it was easy to work with them. Uh, tune into them, make them understand that you're there for them, you're there to, you, you can be trusted. I'm there to help them get the best out of what they have, not to do it my way. Um, sure, we have parameters, but I'm working with artists who really know their, their themselves a lot better than I do, and I'm now going to try and enhance that by capturing those magic moments that we can get out of them. So those, 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 those were the, the type of people that were we used to work with. There was some bands and some people that were very tough to work with, and and the, and the music industry is like a family. There's there's real good moments, and then there's the uh, the wayward children uh, in families too. And um, we had a few of those, and you know it was tough uh, in some cases. Uh, you know, 
one of the, the experiences I had when I was with Led Zeppelin and ACDC, and then um, Em sent me over to see this, this band from Sweden that was this nice family band from Sweden, and I thought, oh, that's cool, man. I, I've been on the road with <laughs> Zeppelin and ACDC, and wow, I was just partying down, and you know, life was 150 miles an hour, and they sent me to, to Sweden and to hook up with this band, and it was a band called ABBA. And uh, I realized right away I still away don't that believe that band, this, by the way. I still, yeah. this is this is the funniest thing you've told me. <laughs> being yeah, being yeah. one of the few people that will publicly admit I'm a huge ABBA fan, uh, when you told me this, yeah. I, I just I, I cannot keep uh, from smiling every time I think about it. Yep, yep. Well, ABBA, band, ABBA was one of the biggest, hardest rock and roll bands around, party wise. They were they were party <laughs> animals, and and it was uh, it was all out. I mean, they were all out then. Uh, you know, again, the, 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 ABBA's the biggest, the, the richest band in the world, too. I mean, ABBA's made more money in music than anybody. But uh, back in those days, man, they were they were, they were were out there playing it, and they were out there. And I thought, here, I'm on vacation. I'm going to you know, be with ABBA. And I remember calling uh, calling Abbott and saying, hey, man, get me back to Zeppelin or get me back to anybody, <laughs> man. And, just, <laughs> and he couldn't believe it. So, um, yeah, ABBA was uh, an experience. And, and I, I love them. And they, they, you know, they, they did their thing, and, and, and I'm very proud of what they did. I mean, they went on, and Mala Mia, I think it's got like 10 touring you know, troops around the world now, and, you know, they, they, they're, on, and they're everywhere. I mean, they're everything, everything. Every time you turn around, you'll find ABBA somewhere. And, uh you know, all those closet ABBA fans, there, there must be millions of them because they're all out, you know, watching ABBA every time, chance they get buying anything that's ABBA related. So there, there's millions out there. But that was an experience for me. And, uh, you know, the, the band I work with now and is, is, is a band I love is, is El Chicano. And El Chicano had six uh, gold and platinum albums from 1970 to 1976. And they're all like my family, you know, Freddie Sanchez and, uh, oh, Gail Sanchez's birthday day, I love and, and best wishes to Gail. I know she'll be listening in. Um, it's her birthday today. But uh, those are the, the those are the good, good and the bad. I love the guys I'm working with. I love the guys I, I mentioned, but they were always a little bit of, uh, I, I want to say, um, surprises along the way. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we're actually the hour has flown by. Um, let's yep. as much as we can in the last few minutes, um, and before we introduce uh, your song, um, let's talk a little bit about. Well, we we know a little bit about where the music industry uh, started, or you know, a lot of the influences on modern music as we know it uh, from um, you sharing with us your experience with the Amit, and then. Um, we know what happened in the 90s with everything going to digital downloads. Um, I, I lived through that, and I just watched uh, I watched the, the labels disappear. I watched uh, people going from getting you know million-dollar signing bonuses and recording at places like the record plant in Sausalito and Fantasy Studios and you name it, and being given these huge budgets and producers, um, and uh, to where it's like, here's $50,000 and a set of Pro Tools, go home and record your album, and seeing how the quality of the music declined because there wasn't that incubation period for bands to develop and, and the labels uh, had, seemed to have no impetus in developing artists. They just went by whatever the internet was telling them most popular, clear up to now where it's all driven by social media. Now, you have a different vision for uh, the music industry tomorrow, and I think think in some ways WLR.net is going to play a part in that, and if you could share that vision with us, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I look at the industry right now as, as, um, as a brand new industry again. Uh, the, the, the record industry as we knew it is dead. It's gone. It, it'll never come back. Um, they can't come back. It's, it's, it's the, the, the technology of today um, allows for so many downloads and so much free distribution of music that you have to take that as a, a, as a a fact and move on and rechange the industry and, and and make it make it different. Um, I look at I look at internet radio that we're on right now and and WLOR.net is part of and I'm really excited about this because I see it as as a as a shopping mall and the more good quality stores you put in the shopping mall, the more people are going to come and watch uh, and, and 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 get involved in in, in shopping your mall and that's what we're trying to do with WLOR right now. We're trying to put real quality. Uh, programs together and, and a variety of programs and, and some real top-notch programs and we've got some of those coming on now and and, and into the future 
And uh, I, I also look at, at the Internet as, as like the old days of pirate radio. Remember the old pirate radios where the, the, you used to have a ship offshore in the UK and they'd be transmitting, uh, you know, wavelengths to, 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 the, to the mainland so that people can tune in in the middle of the night to hear about all the things that are happening in, in, in music it's instead of what then the BBC or the, the, the specific um, radio stations of Europe that were government-owned were, were allowing on the airs. And, and, and that's what you have right now when you have... Uh, you have the big conglomerates. You have uh, conglomerates out there, uh, iHeartRadio and the, and the likes, that they, they loop 100 songs, and that's what you're going to get. You get 100 songs on their radio stations for, for a month and maybe two months. And you, you tune in, and you're hearing the same things over and over and over again. And it's stuff that they have a vested interest in or somebody that's advertising on their, their network or whatever. So you, you're limited to what they consider to be good music. Um, the Internet and WLOR uh, is going to be an outlet for different kinds of music, different kinds of, of, of interview shows, different kinds of, of uh, entertainment shows. And it's going to be our shopping mall of all these, these great stores where people can come to and, and tune in, you know, morning, noon, or night, around the world, wherever you are, you can listen to interesting bits and pieces. I've got a, a, a girl coming on with a radio show. Um, she's one of the top uh, authors in uh, adult and, and, and teenage um fantasy uh, books, and she's written uh, four or five books now on the Cat's Eye Chronicles, and she's going to have a, a radio show and uh, on WLOR coming up uh, in May, and uh, she, it, it's going to be dynamite, because she, she released her last book, Download, it's, and, and the, it, the book industry is going like the, the music industry, it's a digital mm-hmm. download now, so uh, she down, uh, put down a, um, put up a, a brand new digital book, and in, in a couple of days sold 50,000, so I mean, that's the kind of, um, you know, uh, patronage he has and we're going to have her on the radio and these people listening to her on the radio and making you know making a, an interesting format for people that want to come in and, and be part of uh, of WLOR so I'm really happy to be here I'm, I'm in, you know I'm intricately involved I'm, I've got my own show coming up I'm going to have a live show out of uh, out of California uh, with some of the, the great rock and roll stars of our time Verdeen White uh, David Page Andy Khan they're all going to be on my show on April 9th. Bertie and White from Airplane and Fire, David Tate from Toto, Andy Khan from uh, Keywordist with the Turtles. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to get them on and doing what you're doing with me right now, talking about their history and rock and roll and talking about their, their you know, their uh, their stories and, and keep, the, keep the, the, the rock and roll name, the rock and roll game, the rock and roll, you know, uh, plethora of, of, of fun and games alive. And, uh, you know, that's that's what I want to do. Well, Jerry, I want to thank you so much for being on the show tonight. We could go on, and I would like to do this again because there's a lot more I want to cover with you on the music industry, where it's going. I want to talk to you about Tidal and some of the other things that are happening. We'll, we can do that either on another show, on your show, or come on to my show again. Uh, but I'd like you to introduce uh, the song before we play out. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show, and I, I truly appreciate and respect everything that you've done in the industry, and it's just been a Truly an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Okay, and then is it the album song? song that up? That's that's it. Okay. Yep, this is a, a song that I wrote for El Chicano on their new CD. It's coming out in uh, a couple of months now. Uh, a big distribution deal we're working on right now with that. It's called Outbound. It's just about a guy fulfilling his dreams, much like I have in, in my, my career with music. Uh, it's just about a guy coming from a small town, trying to make it in the music business and he's uh he's outbound he's leaving his town going out to the big world and ladies and gentlemen that's what wlor that's about that's what i'm about that's what music's about you know live your life and uh enjoy every minute of it and hope you enjoy outbound
still got some friends along the way In the meantime, I keep singing this song It's all about love, trying to get along Feel the breeze blowing on my face Standing in the shade Eleven 